Greetings, my name is Frida Wimsat, and this is Chapter 17. We're going to talk about the labor and birth complications. Labor and birth at risk. When complications arise, uh, perinatal morbidity and mortality risk will always increase. Some complications are anticipated, um, particularly when mother is identified as high risk and others are unexpected or unforeseen. And that's one of the reasons why prenatal care is so very important. Crucial for nurses to understand the normal birth process and also uh, to be able to prevent and detect deviations from normal labor and birth and to implement nursing measures if complications arise. Nurse and obstetric team uh, must use knowledge and skills in a concerted effort uh, to provide care in the event of complications. So we not only know need to know the assessments and the normals and abnormals of those assessments, but also the critical interventions in order to um, help to facilitate uh, positive outcomes. So we need to obtain a complete uh, prenatal history and interview. Most of the time the prenatal record is on the unit. And now because it's electronic, it's certainly on the unit um, with electronic charting. But it's still very important that we complete a prenatal history and a thorough interview. Prenatal labor and, I'm sorry, preterm labor and birth. First of all, preterm labor and birth. Preterm birth is the length of gestation less than 37 and 0 0.7 weeks, regardless of the weight of the infant. Low birth weight is the weight at the time of birth, and it's usually uh, considered to be low if it's 2,500 grams or less, which is um, less than 5.5 pounds. The less time in the uterus uh, with the gestation correlates with immature organs and immature organ systems, of course, but the low birth weight can actually <clears throat> excuse me, be caused by intrauterine growth restriction. And that intrauterine growth restriction, of course, could be due to interruption, interruptions in the utero-placental perfusion, but uh, intrauterine growth restriction doesn't necessarily mean that it's an early delivery. So, 75% of spontaneous and uh, preterm labor occur following an early initiation of the labor process without maternal or fetal illnesses. So sometimes things just happen and um, both intact membranes and pre premature rupture of membranes often occur in preterm births. Some spontaneous risk factors would be like uterine anomaly, a history of previous preterm birth, multifetal gestation, uh, bleeding of any uh, uncertain origin in pregnancy, periodontal disease, late entry into prenatal care, infections, one of the number one causes, and instrumentation. Sometimes high levels of stress in one or more domains of life because stress increases cortisol levels and cortisol levels can is one of the primary factors of the hormonal um, cause of the start of labor. It um, increases maternal cortisol, will increase fetal cortisol, which will cause a decrease in progesterone, which allows the uterus to contract. And um, of course, um, be more sensitive to oxytocin because you can also mess with estrogen by increasing that. Now, we have um, to indicate uh, indicated preterm things that would cause preterm labor to actually exist would be uh, sometimes it's iatrogenic. It occurs due to maternal or fetal illness, diabetes, hypertension, uh, previous T-shaped uterine incisions and placental disorders or seizures, uh, thromboembolism, uh, asthma, chronic bronchitis, COVID can do that, HIV or herpes infections, obesity, smoking, advanced maternal age, birth defects, RH isoimmunization, 
uh, amniotic fluid index anomalies, either polyhydrominous or oligohydrominous. Some spun causes of spontaneous risk factors would include infection, bleeding episodes during the first trimester, risk of preterm labor rises with the number of bleeding episodes, by the way, so if the person has placenta previa, that could lead to preterm birth. Implantation of the placenta on the uterine uh, septum, which would be an abnormal implantation, placental abruption and hemorrhage, and some of the maternal fetal stress, uh, that can certainly do it. Uterine over-distension from uh, polyhydrominous or uh, multifetal pregnancies or just being pregnant with um, fibroids, allergic reactions and decreased progesterone levels, multiple pathological processes that eventually result in uterine contractions, cervical change, and of course the rupture of the membranes. Let's talk about cervical length. Cervical length is, the, is measured by the transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, and if it's greater than 30 millimeters of mercury in the second and the third um, trimester of pregnancy, it's usually unlikely to give birth. The person is usually unlikely to give birth prematurely, even if they have symptoms of preterm labor. So if that cervical length is 30 millimeters um, in the second and the third trimester pregnancy, then that's usually an indication that the person will not uh, be a candidate for a preterm delivery. And then it's uh, the fetal fibronectin test that determines who is not at risk as well. Uh, the fetal fibronectin, that's the glycoprotein, which is sort of like glue in the plasma that produce, is produced during the fetal development. And it appears in the early and late pregnancy in, in the cervix, in the vaginal secretions. They use a swab. They can do um, a swab vaginal secretions and send it away to the lab. And if during the late second trimester and early third, it signifies placental inflammation if it's present there. And it can trigger um, preterm labor. But it's usually used as an indication as to who will not uh, uh, be at risk for preterm labor. The one that indicates who is at risk for preterm labor is a combination of both the cervical length and the fetal fibronectin uh, are good indicators together of preterm birth. Care management here um, with interventions and prevention. So the onset of preterm labor is insidious and it can easily be mistaken for normal discomforts of pregnancy. In fact, uh, increase in the amount of vaginal discharge will change in the type a vaginal discharge, it can go from watery to mucus or bloody, which would be the passing of the mucus plug. And then cramping with or without diarrhea, mild contractions are often painless. Uh, feeling the uh, fullness in their vagina or heaviness within their thighs, a low, dull back pain, and of course, rupture of membranes. Those would be the assessments for uh, uh, someone going into preterm labor and a lot of times they'll come in and they're like one to three centimeters already and they didn't even know that they were contracting. Um, interventions. Encourage healthy lifestyles, alleviate stress. Uh, we can administer prophylactic progesterone supplementation where they give them daily vaginal suppositories or creams or weekly intramuscular injections of alpha hydroxy progesterone and that can actually decrease the rate of preterm birth by about 40 percent in women with a history of prior preterm birth or with cervical length of 15 to 20 millimeters before 24 weeks gestation which is the point of viability and a uh, cervical length actually is the best indicator for starting progesterone therapy if there's a short cervical length they want to go ahead and get that progesterone therapy started uh, some of the things that you would want to teach the patient would be that dehydration can cause uterine irritability, infection can cause uterine irritability, so lying on their side increases placental perfusion. So what you'd want to do is uh, stop, tell them to, if they're feeling any of those symptoms, having any of those symptoms, low, dull back pain, etc., if in there at home is to stop what they're doing, lie down on their side, to drink about two to three glasses of water uh, to increase their hydration state or juice, and then lie on their side and wait for an hour. And if the symptoms get worse, call their healthcare provider. 
the safest thing to do is to actually, if they are, is to have them come on into the hospital or to the doctor's office and, and put them on the monitor, get a non-stress test to kind of see what's going on, look to see what their contractions are looking like, and let the healthcare provider take it from there, uh, certainly. But because sometimes having people stay at home and try to self-care uh, can be detrimental. Now, that may have changed due to the COVID restrictions. But some of the, of course, the best thing to do is early recognition and diagnosis. And then, of course, activity restriction, restriction of sexual activity, uh, home care, and like I said, making sure that they understand what those signs of, of preterm labor may be. Okay, such as the cramping with or without diarrhea, mild contractions, often painless, feeling the fullness in their vagina and heaviness in their thighs. That's a feeling of the fetal descent. So they certainly want to be aware of those things. Some interventions that might be appropriate would be suppression of the uterine activity, um, like by giving them tocolytics and promotion of fetal lung maturity by giving them steroids and management of the inevitable preterm birth by preparing for delivery. And then of course, fetal and early natal loss uh, resolved through sharing. You wanna talk about the um, contraindications uh, to tocolytic therapy. And that of course would be maternal preeclampsia, gestational hypertension with severe features because breathing uh, tocolytics that increases um, heart rate significantly, uh, greater than plus three protein, brisk DTRs, clonus, headaches, spots before their eyes, uh, and seizures, uh, hemorrhage, uh, you want to compare their H and H before and after, or if they've had significant cardiac disease because of the side effects of the tocolytics, uh, can exasperate exacerbate, excuse me, uh, those um, other comorbidities. And then promotion of the, um, if the, the fetus is, if the gestational age is 37 weeks or more, they need to just probably go ahead and deliver. So it's not something that we would try to delay because that's actually considered term. Uh, fetal demise that would or a lethal fetal anomaly like anencephalic or chorioamnitis or evidence of acute or chronic fetal compromise you certainly don't want to try to impede or stop a delivery under those circumstances and if they have like sinusoidal or late decelerations or deep variables or their biophysical profile is less than eight those are situations to where we want to go ahead and deliver. Interventions that reduce neonatal and infant uh, morbidity. Transferring the mother before the birth to a hospital equipped to care for the preterm infant. Uh, that's sort of the best thing. She's the best um, transporter is to be transported inside the mother. So if we can transport the mother to a tertiary care center before she delivers, that's going to be good for her and her baby. Administering <clears throat> antibiotics during labor to prevent neonatal group B streptococcus infection. Administering betamethasone or dexamethasone to increase fetal lung surfactant. And also it will prevent or reduce intraventricular hemorrhage and nectarizing intracorylitis. And also giving her mag sulfate to women giving birth before 32 weeks gestation to reduce the incidence of cerebral palsy. The woman should monitor, we should monitor her if she's receiving tocolytic therapy. Uh, there's a box in your textbook set box 17.5 and a safety alert for mag sulfate medication guide and beta methasone. Premature rupture of membranes. Let's talk about premature rupture of membranes. It's called PROM as an abbreviation. And uh, it's usually caused by urogenital tract infections. That's the major risk factor associated with preterm pre-ROM. And uh, so premature rupture of membranes is where the amniotic sac ruptures 
or there's leakage of amniotic fluid beginning at at least at least one hour before the onset of labor at any gestational age. And then there's the PROM, which is the preterm premature rupture of membranes. That is where the membranes rupture before 37 and 07 weeks of gestation. Infection is the major risk factor there. Uh, there could be some pathological weakening of the amniotic membranes uh, due to inflammation and also uh, stress from uterine contraction. PROM is actually uh, de determined for each woman based on an estimate of risk and also infection, I said, is the greatest risk and labor will likely be induced if a woman comes in with PROM. The treatment would be uh, for both PROM and PPROM. We actually are going to man manage that very conservatively and use hospitalization, certainly, but if she is... Um, just a regular PROM, she would be induced, but she would also be treated with ampicillin or gentamicin. And if she's allergic to uh, ampicillin, she would get clindamycin or cleosin and also flagyl. They would treat, treat group B strep, but they can also uh, prevent chorioamnitis. And of course, the chorio occurs from ascending infections after the rupture of membranes. So a woman who has PPROM because she's premature, she's going to stay in the hospital, uh, and we may not deliver her, but we would try to give her the antibiotics because if it's a very small tear in the amniotic membranes, they can seal that with antibiotics, and sometimes those ladies go home and have to come back and be induced later. Um, women can develop bacteremia, uh, and the neonate is at risk for pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis, and cerebral palsy. A case study here. So let's talk about this case study. We have a 27-year-old female. She's at 36 weeks gestation. She's a gravita 2, which means she has had one pregnancy and she has a pregnancy on board. She's a para 2, which means she gave birth to um, past the point of viability. She is, um, so, so here uh, the T means she has zero terms. The other P means she had gave birth to two preterm babies, no abortions. She has two children living, one on board, and she had one multiple. So she gave birth to twins previously. Her blood type is B negative. She should have had Rogam at 28 weeks gestation. And we'll wait to see what the, this baby on board, what that baby's blood type is and determine whether or not if, the baby's blood type is uh, positive, then she'll receive Rogam again within 72 hours after delivery. She's immune for rubella. She is group B strep positive. Um, she's negative for VDRL, which is syphilis, HIV, herpes, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and COVID times two. Her hemoglobin is 12. Her hematocrit is 35. We usually like for the hemoglobin to be above 11 and for the hematocrit to be above 33, so that's good. Two-hour postperennial is 110. We'd like for that to be at least 120 or below 120. Uh, her urine is dark, amber, scant amount, pungent odor. She's guarding during flight, flank assessment, and her WBCs is 18,000. So you can see right there uh, the WBCs are elevated above the 15,000 range, which means that she definitely has an infection, even though normally uh, during pregnancy, the neutrophils are elevated to like between five and 15,000. So it uh, seems like she has um, pyelonephritis because of the, the flank pain and whatnot. And she had a previous C-section with low uterine transverse incision. So she desires to have a VBAC. That would be possible. And um, she desires to breastfeed. She complains of leaking and low back pain. So this pyelonephritis has actually taken her into preterm labor uh, symptoms is what's happening here. Her temperature is 99.4, her pulse is 88, respiratory rate is 20. Blood pressure is not considered hypertensive yet, but it is pre-hypertensive. It's 136 over 84, and her um, saturation rate is 99% on room air. The baby has a non-reactive, I'm sorry, has a reactive non-stress test. I'm trying to make things worse than what they are, it seems like. 
All right, so um, we're going to give her IV fluids, antibiotics. She's going to get some Tylenol for that temperature. Uh, and we would, of course, there again, verify that her Rogam was given at 28 weeks gestation. Chorioamniitis. Chorioamniitis um, is a bacterial infection of the amniotic cavity. The major cause of complications in like 1 to 5% of term births, 25% of preterm births. The clinical findings are maternal fever, fetal tachycardia, uterine tenderness, and foul odor of the amniotic fluid. And that person would be treated with ampingent or clindamycin and also flagell. The post-term pregnancy, labor, and birth. We always talk about the preterm labor and birth, but post-term, uh, they can also uh, suffer with complications as well. Dating usually... Uh, with the ultrasound during the first trimester is more reliable than the last menstrual period. The clinical manifestations of uh, someone going beyond 42 weeks is maternal weight loss more than three pounds per week because that placenta is starting to deteriorate and so is the amniotic fluid. Decreased uterine size related to decreased amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid could be meconium stained because the placenta is starting to deteriorate so it's preventing and cause in utero placenta um, a, the, a lack of perfusion there between the uterus and the placenta because the placenta is deteriorating. So that baby in there is actually surviving on its reserves. It's surviving on reserve nutrition, which means it's typically born long and thin, very long fingernails, really long hair, wide-eyed appearance. Uh, skin can be tinged green or brown from living in um, meconium stain, amniotic fluid for an extended period of time. The baby is typically hypoxic uh, and um, glucose levels are really low. So those are some of the, the issues there with uh, fetal risk. And also the fact that the skull bones are starting to calcify so the baby may not fit through the birth canal uh, at this point because of the advanced maturation of the fetal skull. Dysfunctional labor. So dysfunctional labor is defined as long, difficult, or abnormal labor. It's ineffective uterine uh, contractions, which are the powers, uh, alterations in the pelvic structure, which is the passage, fetal causes of the passenger, and maternal position during labor and birth, as well as psychological response to the woman. I'm sorry, of the woman, excuse me. So the abnormal uterine activity. So during, uh, so we have the latent phase disorders and we have the active phase disorders. Hypertonic uterine contractions. The force of contractions may be in the midsection of the uterus rather than in the fundus. And therefore, the uterus cannot apply downward pressure to push the presenting part against the cervix to cause the cervix to dilate and to efface. And so the uterus uh, may not even be able to relax between contractions. In this situation, what we have to do is sedate her to quieten that uterus and then restart her with um, an augmented uh, labor within like 12 hours after the sedation. We give her Stadol or Ambien uh, in the presence of pain and also morphine to inhibit contractions or to reduce pain and, and to encourage sleep. And therefore, in the morning, induction would be started with Pitocin. The, the, her, her obstetrical uh, physician or midwife, of course, is going to do all these orders and the nurses will carry these orders out, okay? Uh, protracted disorders. Protracted disorders is where progress in labor is slower than normal, and most common is a hypotonic uterine dysfunction, where uh, it usually begins during the active phase, but then the contractions become very, very weak and in inefficient, and they just stop altogether. So this woman is doing fine during the latent phase, and all of a sudden when she hits six centimeters or so, it just stops. Everything stops. Contractions stop. Um, any type of progress in labor with descent, all of that is halted at this point. And if she has an inner uterine pressure catheter in, that means that the uh, pressure of her uterus is going to be less than 25 millimeters of mercury. 
There's also such thing as arrested disorders, and that's where there's no progress in labor whatsoever. And the reasons there could be cephalic pelvic disproportion or fetal mouth position, brow, face, or occipital posterior presentation. And if these findings are normal, uh, they can use labor augmentation, ambulation, hydrotherapy, uh, and amniotomy, which is a form of uh, labor augmentation, nipple stimulation, or of course, uh, Pitocin to try to restart or to start. Um, and most of the time, it, they're gonna go get an ultrasound and see what's going on and see if this mouth is uh, positioning or CPD or exactly where the station is of that baby. And of course, they probably would end up with a C-section. Um, all right, um, secondary powers. So secondary powers, an epidural block uh, would actually impede the Ferguson reflex or that bearing down reflex because when the when the baby's presenting part hit her um, stretch receptors on the pelvic floor, she's not going to be able to feel that because of the epidural, and so and also the exhaustion of just being in labor for an extended period of time and her position can be the reason for uh, a lack of the secondary powers. The active labor begins, of course, at six centimeters in cervical dilation. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's, of course, the precipitous labor. The precipitous labor is less than three hours from the onset to delivery. The results here is in a hypertonic contractions, placental abruption, uterine tachycystole, and, of course, it can be related to recent cocaine use. It can cause uterine rupture, lacerations, amniotic fluid embolism, uh, or postpartum hemorrhage, and of course the fetus would suffer with hypoxia and intracranial trauma related to the rapid birth. Pelvic dystocia, it doesn't have to be related to cocaine, so don't, don't um, misunderstand what I've said. I said that, that that's a risk factor, that it could be related to that, but it's not always or even most of the time related to that. Some women are just designed that way and they just have precipitous deliveries in birth, okay? Pelvic dystocia, um, pelvic dystocia, where they have contractures of the pelvic diameter exist that reduce the capacity of the bony pelvis. There's also uh, immature pelvic size for mothers who are really young, like 10 to 11 years old. And I know it's very difficult to say that. Uh, the congenital anomaly or neoplasms or lower spinal disorders. So if a person has really bad, um, uh, actually um, a really bad spinal disorder like not severe lower doses or, but scoliosis, if they have severe scoliosis, that of course can impede delivery. And also, they may not get an epidural, too. Soft tissue dystocia. Soft tissue dystocia is low-lying placenta uh, or leomas, where they have these uterine fibroids that grow right along with the baby. Lower uterine segment, um, ovarian tumors, a very full bladder. Come on, people. A very full bladder can impede the descent of the baby, and that's the reason when a woman receives an epidural, we always put a Foley catheter in her so that she can keep her bladder empty and the baby would not be, it descent would not be impeded there. Uh, a really full rectum, and uh, we used to give enemas all the time, but now they don't recommend that. But a full rectum can also uh, impede um, descent through the vagina. And it may prevent the fetus from entering the pelvis if there's a, if there's a full bladder or huge tumors of that nature. Fetal causes would be anomaly or management are left. We have uh, abnormal labor patterns. We talked about there's like a prolonged latent phase. We talked about that protracted active phase and dilation, secondary arrest, protracted descent, and failure to descend altogether. D different variations of breach presentations here. Uh, the single footling breach, which is letter C, is an obstetrical emergency because of the risk of the prolapsed cord. All of these could have the uh, cord to prolapse very easily. Uh, the, the external version 
uh, with correct amniotic fluid. So the best time to do an external version to try to turn this baby into the right position to try to deliver vaginally is if the mother is, has the correct amniotic fluid volume, if she's at least 39 weeks gestation, non-obese, she has had more than one baby, no previous C-section or major abdominal surgeries, she is the perfect person to try to do an external version on because it takes away all of the uh, compl contraindications for the complications later. This is a, a diagram of a breech uh, delivery example. So uh, we have the sacrum presenting and um, the engagement and internal rotation would be letter B. The baby's engaged and we have, see here, this will be the symphys pubis and we have internal rotation. Lateral flexion here is letter C. And then the letter D is external rotation and restitution. The bums and the legs are out here. Uh, the X and then letter E here, we'll put coming down, we have the internal rotation where the shoulders of the shoulders and the head. And then letter F, what's happening with letter F is we have the face, the face rotates to the sacrum when the occiput is anterior. And then that's where problems can result because if that baby's chin is tucked really tight, then we're going to have a good delivery. If that baby's chin is hyperextended, looks like it's in the military position here, but if it's hyperextended, that's where we could have problems. So the head is borne by gradual flexion during elevation of the fetal body. So we're going to pull the fetal body up in the air and just gradually uh, cause that baby to flex his or her head uh, for delivery. Hopefully that would be a midwife or a physician attempting this. Uh, usually they deliver breech babies by C-section, but if it's a second or twin delivery, uh, they will usually try to do an internal version to flip that baby around so that the baby comes head first. Obesity. Obesity increasing serious, serious problem for pregnant women likely to uh, begin their pregnancy with pre-existing conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Also increased risk of post-date pregnancy and complications, inability to feel fetal movements, daily kick counts, and uh, nursing care has many challenges.